When Rajiv Gandhi requested me to introduce Ambassador Sujin Chinoy, I was thrilled. As I've known him since 1973, uh, during my time at the Rajkumar College in Rajkot. And this just seemed so natural for me to come and say a few words about him. Thank you, Rajiv. Ambassador Chinoy is a distinguished figure in the realm of international diplomacy, with a career that spans over three decades in the foreign service. His career trajectory reflects his commitment to strengthening India's diplomatic ties and enhancing its role on the global stage. He is well respected for his deep expertise on East and Southeastern Asian geopolitical affairs. Presently, he is the Director General of Manohar Parik, Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis since 2019. He is the current chair of the Think20 Engagement Group for India's G20 Presidency. A career diplomat from 1981 to 2018, he held several important diplomatic assignments, to name a few, Ambassador to Mexico and Japan, India's Council General in Shanghai and Sydney, India's representative to the first committee at the UN in New York, Director of India Related Affairs in New Delhi in the Ministry of External Affairs as a specialist on China, East Asia, and political, military, and security issues. Ambassador Chinoy has just been nominated to the Distinguished Nine Member Committee to explore the transformation of DRDO. This strategic move is a directive from Prime Minister Modi to revamp the DRDO, which consumes almost 7% of India's defense spending. The objective, in my opinion, is possibly to revolutionize the landscape of Indian defense management, thereby enhancing its efficiency, preparedness, and adaptability to meet contemporary challenges. He's a member of the Padma Awards Selection Committee since 2021. Due to his NCC background, the National Cadet Corps, Ambassador Chinoy has been appointed as member of the Governing Council of the NCC Alumni Association of India, headed by the Raksha Mantri, and its first member was none other than our Prime Minister. He's a prolific writer, contributes to newspapers and journals, and has a packed lecture circuit across India and overseas. The book being launched today is an anthology of his writings over the past three to four years. This is just one such outcome of his writings. He is fluent in English, Chinese, Mandarin, and conversant in French, Spanish, German, Japanese, Arabic, Urdu, and French, Creole. I hope I got that right. Oh yes, and Hindi and Gujarati. <laughs> He's excellent at rifle shooting at a national level at once upon a time, and tent pegging. It's a precision sport on horseback that requires one to nimbly control a galloping horse that inherently has a mind of its own. This, this is basically, an, it, it turns horse riding into an art form. Now all these positions and achievements makes one wonder where he came from. It begs that question. What are the layers in his foundations, ones that supported him to build a solid rock of himself today? Ambassador Chinoy is a proud son of Gujarat, grandson of Barrister C. N. Chinoy, the Diwan of Rajkot State then, and son of Sri Ramesh and Srimati Usha Chinoy. His father was an IPS officer, a stickler to rules, who was his idol and inspiration. He developed his love for sitar and outdoors and horseback riding from his father. His father had a natural talent to music. Sitar was his favorite, but he naturally found himself to be playing 20 different musical instruments without any formal training. That showed his natural inclination to music. Mrs. Chinoy was a trained classical singer, a class A artist with All India Radio. She was also a teacher at the Rajkumar College in Rajkot, where Sujan Bai spent his formative years. Talking about Mrs. Chinoy, she was my class teacher while I was at RKC in grade three. I still remember her face very well. 
Ambassador Sujan credits his school RKC in a large part for shaping him in his early years and for all he did and did not do in the years ahead. RKC instilled in him a drive to excel. Besides academics and NCC, he was lead sitar player and won several music prizes in successive years. He still plays the sitar. He gave a public performance in Mexico with his rendition of Raghupati Raghav and uh, Vaishnava Janato Tene Chahiye. He did that with just three months of practice in Mexico. From school, he went to MS University in Varodhra, where he pursued English literature, and where, in his words, the pupa blossomed into a butterfly. He excelled in swimming, made the Baroda aquatic team, took up bodybuilding, was the second runner-up at the Junior Mr. Gujarat Championship. He continued with NCC levels B and C, further at, at college, won the best cadet Gujarat state, and excelled in 303 rifle shooting at the national level in 1997. I'm sorry, 1977. The NCC instilled in him discipline that he lives by even today. Amongst his defense meetings, whenever people comment on his discipline and his, and his approach to everyday uh, scheduling and all, he says NCC is the, is the reason that has instilled that discipline in him. And he lives by it even today. He went further to gain an MBA from BK School of Management in Ahmedabad. With his exposure and experience, it is no wonder that he is the go-to person for the Indian government on boundary equations and is, and is a reliable wicket keeper for this job. Today he says he has more drive than when he was 25. He has miles to go before he hangs up his boots. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Ambassador Sujin <laughs> Thank you very much for that elaborate uh, introduction. I invite Ambassador Sujan Chinoy for his theme address. But before that, I request Rohit Bhai Patel, our past president, to come up and greet uh, Sujan Bhai with a bouquet of flowers. Here. Thank you, Rohit Bhai. I invite Ambassador Chinoy for his theme address. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Namaskar. I want to begin by firstly expressing a profound thanks to Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, Mr. Mukesh Patel, Mr. Devyesh Radia, Mr. Amit Shukla, Savan Bhai, and all those who have made it possible for us to be here together this evening. Let me tell you, it's very difficult to speak before an audience such as this, especially if you have schoolmates in the audience. <laughs> there are people here this evening who have seen me nearly 58 years ago as a six-year-old boy. They know all about me. There's nothing I can do to impress them. <laughs> it's also very difficult to impress an audience when there are people in the audience who have been with you at college, from the BK School of Business Management. There's a whole row full of my esteemed classmates there. So try as I might this evening is going to be an uphill task for me. And twice in my life, I began my journey here in this great city of Ahmedabad. Once when I had no choice, I was born here. But once when I had a choice, which is when I came after my graduation in Baroda to Ahmedabad, and no Chandan, I don't regret having to spend time with you in college as well. <laughs> and I spent two beautiful years of my life 
here again, 1978 to 1980. And I was also reminded by Mr. Mukesh Patel's generous praise, the fact that uh, he recalls very clearly that I am one of the founding members of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association. And try as he might, he did not succeed in getting me to pay my membership dues again when he made me the patron of the organization. <laughs> For like a good Gujarati, I keep my accounts well and I had the receipt on my files. But thank you for that uh, gesture as well. Well, friends, when I left Ahmedabad in 1980, and that was a very long time ago, 43 years ago, the world was very different. We were still in the middle of the Cold War. We were still in an era where the Soviet Union had gone into Afghanistan, an era in which there were tensions between Iraq and Iran. And all that we know of the dismantling of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the arrival of the unipolar decade of the 1990s, the phenomenal rise of China, all that lay ahead. And I, a good novice in the Foreign Service, lived through these times over the last four decades or more, I have therefore seen this world order, the global order changing. Not always in a steady manner, often lurching, often unpredictably, often suddenly, but constantly. This book that I have written is essentially an anthology of many of my writings, plus some fresh writings that I attempted over the last few years. And it's written from a vantage point, which is unique because uh, when I hung up my boots in Tokyo, the Prime Minister had appointed me as the Director General of India's largest defense, national security and international relations think tank. But more than that, I've had the singular privilege of working as part of the ecosystem over the last four and a half years. And therefore, one can say that I was able to look through the keyhole in the last four and a half years, not to speak of the 38 odd years that I spent in the Foreign Service, to see how the world has been changing. And truly, I reached the conclusion that uh, it would be important for me to share my thoughts and writings with the people of this country, for these assessments cut quite close to the bone. For I have said in my book many things that government may not be in a position to say. But I'm quite sure many in government share the same views as I have put across in this compilation and book. And so let me begin with the basic premise that the title itself suggests that we live in a world which is in flux. It's a rapidly changing world. It is unrecognizable in part. It is a global order that was set up as we know it, the current global order at the end of the Second World War, when the victors took all the spoils. And for the first time in the history of the international community, an institution such as the United Nations was set up in the hope and belief that it would provide stability a new kind of security architecture, a new kind of framework in which the international community could work on peace and progress and economic development. And to the victors went all the spoils. For when the Security Council was set up, it was set up with a degree of exceptionalism. And a very Anglo-Saxon or European looking team of victors added a bit of color by bringing in a large, populous, agrarian nation known then as the Republic of China, which had been one of the theaters during the conflict of the Second World War as also a permanent member of the Security Council. But that world has remain, remained frozen since then, but not entirely so. It is being challenged 
as a result of the shifting of the balance of power over the last several decades from Europe, where the traditional engines of growth resided in the past, to Asia in the last four decades. And we have seen this transformation taking place in an ineluctable manner, in an inevitable manner, aided and abetted by the phenomenal rise of China. But when we look at the world today, we see that it is increasingly, despite there being an existing global order that has survived structurally since 1945, we live in a world which is increasingly fractured. It is fragmented in part. It is fractured in part. And we have seen how it is very difficult for the existing framework to deliver in a cohesive, cooperative manner on some of the larger issues that confront humankind today. The larger issues and challenges of terrorism, of climate change, of economic recovery in the post-COVID pandemic era. These are things on which the global community is unable to develop consensus because of major power contestation. There is therefore a weakening of the global system as we know it, the existing global order. There is increased multipolarity, less of multilateralism, more of multi-alignment and issue-based alignment. And no single country today, as we see it, is in a position in a world that is drifting towards multipolarity, which is no longer a unipolar world of the type that prevailed in the 1990s after the demise of the Soviet Union, which is no longer a bipolar world of the type that we saw and experienced during the Cold War. In such a world, there is no single country that is able to make its writ felt on all issues at all times in all geographies. And so it is also the destiny of the United States, once a preeminent power, still a very potent power, still the world's largest military and the largest economy. It is quite clear that it no longer dominates in the manner in which it did. And this is because of the rise of China, for example. As a rising hegemon, it has challenged the existing hegemon, that is the United States of America. But it is also a period in which many other middle powers have found their niche, who are also growing exponentially and are increasingly able to develop greater elbow room for their own growth and development, to make strategic choices based on autonomy. When I look back at the global structure, I am reminded of the importance of maintaining peace and stability. That's the primary driver behind any global structure. In Europe, for example, in the 17th century, the Treaty of Westphalia was instrumental in creating certain structures to provide peace and stability. It resulted, for example, by the second half of the 19th century in a united Germany, a Germany that by 1871 was not only united but also extremely uh, big an economy under the leadership of uh, Bismarck. It was also a period in which Japan, after being forced open by Commodore Perry, had decided to learn the ways of the West, to acquire Western technologies and to repeat the performance for the first time in Asia. And so by the time you get to the end of the 19th century, the global order is already in flux with the rise of a major power in Europe such as Germany, in Asia, a Japan that had not only risen but was also increasingly militarizing in such manner that when Rabindranath Tagore went to Japan, he had written uh, fearfully about the potential for conflict in the future if Japan continued down the same path. As the 20th century unfolded, we saw that a militarized Germany was actually challenging Great Britain, a country that had an empire of its own one that dominated the high seas and there was a naval conflict between uh, an arms race between Germany and Britain that continued well through the opening decade or two of the 20th century. As it was, these major power contestations led to the First World War. The First World War was devastating, but it was not planned. It was not the type of structure that we 
claim to attribute today to the quadrilateral security dialogue that there is uh, the making of a treaty alliance partnership in the Indo-Pacific today that is out to contain China. There was no such thing during the First World War. The UK, for example, uh, joined battle in 1914. Italy joined in 1915. The United States joined on, only in 1917 after the Battle of Jutland. Uh, and it was therefore a war that evolved. This is something that is still possible in the 21st century. That there are no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, there are permanent interests. And based on the impact that the global situation has on a nation's interests, nations decide whether they are on one side or the other. And this is increasingly a feature of our world that is upside down, no longer recognizable, no longer predictable in the same manner. After the end of the First World War, a disastrous war, an attempt was made, as you are all aware, through the Treaty of Versailles to bring about peace, but it too failed. It failed to rein in the urge, uh, the frustrations that powers like Japan and Germany had. The League of Nations the following year was also an ill-conceived attempt to create a global structure akin to what followed later in the United Nations. It too failed to keep peace, primarily because the greatest economy by then on earth, not yet the greatest military power, that's the United States of America, did not fully support the League of Nations. Commitment to global structures matter at the end of the day. How seriously we take these structures, how seriously we take the United Nations today, how seriously do the permanent members take the United Nations. This matters in determining whether the United Nations still is good enough for the world that we live in today. And we have seen how after the failure of both the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, the lid could not be kept uh, on uh, the pot and it led to the militarization once again of Germany and Japan, ultimately to the catastrophic Second World War. And the Second World War gave rise to the first and the only example of a peaceful transition and transfer of power from a reigning hegemon to a rising hegemon. In that case, a depleted, enervated Great Britain, exhausted by the travails of the Second World War, exhausted by the demands uh, of Swaraj and independence in India, giving way peacefully to the rise of the United States of America. That is the structure that still prevails today. But is it fair? Is it a structure that provides for the aspirations of the global community today? Does it account for powers that have risen since then? The answer is no. For we have seen that the post-1945 world order moved very quickly into the era of the Cold War. Within two years of the end of the Second World War, the Cold War was raging by 1947 between the Soviet Union uh, and the East Bloc and the uh, you know, West Bloc uh, led by the United States. We went through a long period, a bipolar world in which these two countries decided and these two blocs decided the state of affairs at the international level. A contrasting feature today is that uh, never before during the Cold War did the two competing sides have economic interdependence between them. They were able to work together on some of the key issues such as for instance, nuclear uh, you know, weapons and reductions and, and treaties to that effect. But they did not depend on one another for economic activity. But today the world is vastly different. Today the rising hegemon that is China and the reigning hegemon that is the United States of America are linked intrinsically to one another. They are like Siamese twins. They are conjoined at the hips. One cannot think of economic prosperity without the other. And this mutual interdependence also makes for a restricted spectrum of strategic choices, especially for the United States of America, which stands for a free and open world, the liberal trading order, which looks at the freedom of navigation and overflight as basic principles in our part of the world and elsewhere. So we are looking at a, a vastly changed world in which the existing structures have not truly changed. When the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in 1991, it gave rise to 
a brief interlude of a decade, 10 years, in which the United States of America, a hyperpower, stood all by itself in splendid isolation at the top of the heap. But that era lasted only 10 years. Tensions between China, which had overcome the difficulties and contradictions of uh, global isolation in the immediate aftermath of Tiananmen had recovered and was already nipping at the heels of the United States of America. And by 2001, uh, ironically, with the fullest help from the United States of America, China enters into the WTO because the United States by 1999 had given full normal trading status to the People's Republic of China, even though it was not a market economy. And by 2001, China enters the WTO and there's no looking back. China's phenomenal rise, uh, particularly after 1990, even more so after its entry into the WTO, has made for a major contradiction in the global order. It has put a great challenge because China's rise has not been very predictable. It's not been very smooth. It's not been without challenge. China's rise, particularly its unilateralism, its use of immense economic power to militarize and to call in question the existing global order to suit its requirements is one of the biggest challenges that my book explores. We have seen how the UN Security Council failed to reform. Over the past seven decades or more, the United Nations saw very little of reforms. The only time that the United Nations made a small effort at reform was in 1961, when the ECOSOC, the council that dealt with this subject, decided that it was time to bring about some change, to bring about greater representation, to democratize the UN Security Council, and it took four years to get to 1965, and that too resulted only in a cosmetic change when the non-permanent category of the UN Security Council was expanded and the total numbers went up from 11 to 15. It has since frozen in time. It has remained frozen. There has been no further change since then. When we look at the other attributes of the existing global order, the global order that we still value, one that we do not want to challenge, one that it would be unwise to challenge, but one which we must demand makes itself subject to genuine reforms is also the Bretton Woods structures like the IMF and the World Bank. We cannot speak of a level playing field if in the IMF a single country like the United States of America has what you call voting rights in excess of 17 percent. And if the IMF's charter itself says that you need a full 85 percent of votes for a consensus to develop, it is obvious that one country, therefore, can stall any kind of change. This is particularly relevant because in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, uh, particularly the Ukraine war, when there's been a great disruption with regard to supply chains, it is vitally important for the global community to work together. Without there being some consensus, it's virtually impossible to address the distress that is felt by 75 countries or more with regard to their economic well-being in the aftermath of two major challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the war in Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, when we look at the world today, we see that it is recognizable as the same order that was put in place in 1945. In many ways, it still is the same, but in many ways, it is not the same. Things have changed because power has got more distributed throughout the world. If we look at the rise of China being a point of inflection, for example, in the changing global order, it is not as if the rest of the world has been marking time while China has risen. But this is a point that China fails to understand. We are aware of the fact that the global engines of economic growth shifted over the last 30 or 40 years to our part of the world, to Asia. In Asia, we have seen how Japan rose from the ashes of the Second World War, Phoenix-like, to take up a new role, a new avatar as a manufacturing hub for the rest of the world by the time uh, we get to the 1960s. We have seen how the Asian tigers benefited thereafter from that great big connect between manufacturing hubs in Asia, whether in Southeast Asia, whether in Japan, whether in Korea, whether in Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, 
and that one big great market across the Pacific, that is the United States of America. We have seen how in the late 1970s, China too benefited from that great big connect between Asia and the United States of America, between hubs uh, devoted to manufacturing in Asia and that big market. The benevolent touch of that market can actually uh, change the destiny of many manufacturing powers. We have seen that in the case of China. And yet we have realized today that China finds it very difficult to adjust to these changes. China as today the world's second largest economy, it is a $19 trillion economy and may overtake the United States in the near future. It demands that the rest of the world adapt to its rise and adjust for the phenomenal accretion in China's power. But China fails to recognize that while China has been growing, the rest of the world, particularly neighboring countries like India, others in Southeast Asia, whether the Philippines, whether Thailand, whether Indonesia, even Bangladesh, all the way up to the littoral of the Indian Ocean and the dynamic economies of Africa, they too have been growing. To deny the relative achievement of these countries is also to deny equality to deny equal opportunity in this kind of a shift of balance of you know, manufacturing and, and economic progress towards our part of the world. And that is why in the course of my book, I have explored these themes, the Asia-Pacific versus the Indo-Pacific. Why is it that China is wedded to the concept of the Asia-Pacific? After all, the Asia-Pacific is a concept, as I said, which appeared after the end of the Second World War because of that great connect between manufacturing hubs in Asia and a big market in the United States of America. But after 2001, no doubt China has grown, but countries like India have also grown. And the Indo-Pacific, in my view, therefore, in the current context where virtually everyone in the region has a vision for the Indo-Pacific, this concept that unites two large geographies the Indian Ocean littoral, the Pacific Ocean littoral, all the economies in between, the continental spaces, the South China Sea, intervening spaces are all one today. This is something that is more representative, it is more democratic, it is more in tune with the aspirations of many more people around the world. And therefore, it is a concept that needs further elaboration. I'm not surprised that the Chinese would challenge this concept because their centrality lay in continued use of the term Asia-Pacific. When it comes to the Indo-Pacific, the People's Republic also must share space with others, including India. Let me also mention that in virtually every geography that you see today, there are seven factors which I describe as the seven T's that challenge the existing global order and pose fresh you know, challenges create more friction between major powers. These are trade, technology, territorial differences. Uh, you have uh, terrorism, that's the fourth T. Tenets, as in narratives, principles, values, as the fifth T. Transparency, or the lack of it, as the sixth T. And finally, a big T that is absent, that is the T of trust. And if you explore each of these themes, you will see that these are equally applicable to the Indo-Pacific, they are equally applicable to Sino-US relations, to India-China relations, to Ukraine and the European theater where, you know, uh, existing security paradigms have been completely upended for the first time in seven decades. Why do I say so? I say this because trade is something that is an offshoot. Burgeoning trade has been an offshoot of globalization. But not all countries have benefited equally from the process of globalization. Some countries have gamed the system much more than others, which is why the WTO lies today in shambles with its appellate authority also unable to get the work done with regard to you know, facilitation of trade or dispute settlement. Trade is fungible. Trade is very difficult for governments to control, which is why this whole concept of decoupling from uh, an adversary like China has proved to be very difficult for the United States. By the way, it's proved very difficult for India. It's proved very difficult for Japan. It's proved very difficult for Australia. Imagine all the quadrilateral security dialogue countries have found, ironically, their trade 
with China burgeoning in the aftermath of all the friction that has been seen in recent years. That's because trade is not handled out of the Pentagon or the State Department or South Bloc or the Sachivalais anywhere. They are handled by people like you sitting in the audience. This has to do with the structural nature and characteristics of various economies, the kind of supply chains that require to be uh, you know, nurtured in order to import and export to survive. And therefore, trade has been difficult to control. People are now using the term de-risking. But this de-risking also has been far more successful with regard to the second T, the T of technology. Now that's where the game changes because technology, especially high-end technology, is not something that is made at home. Billions of dollars go in, large corporates put in money. These work closely with government, sometimes government agencies and departments uh, like DARPA, for instance, in the United States in defense technologies, they pour in billions of dollars. This is something that can be controlled with regard to export controls, with regard to sanctions. And you are seeing that war unfold today between the United States and China. China benefited from US technologies for a full half century after the reset in the 1970s brought about by you know, Henry Kissinger and his patron, President Nixon. That 50-year strategic partnership has completely unraveled in recent times. And now the United States is taking steps, corrective steps. It had lost uh, the plot. It was sleeping at the wheel. I could use a number of such phrases to describe US behavior. It had dropped the ball. It had taken its eye off the ball. It had created a vacuum. Nature abhors the vacuum. The Chinese stepped into that vacuum, especially in the Asia Pacific. Uh, when the United States was uh, primarily focused on the international war on terror in the opening decade of this century. But all that literally means that the United States today is taking corrective action through the Inflation Reduction Act, through the CHIPS Act, through the Science Act, pouring in billions of dollars to rectify that. French shoring, onshoring. The whole idea is to bring back manufacturing, to take the initiative once again into their own hands. And mind you, I do believe that the United States, the world's largest economy, still the most potent, uh, still with the most potent technologies, has it in itself to, to keep that lead in, in, in cutting edge technologies vis-a-vis -vis the United, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the People's Republic of China. Even if China were to overtake the United States of America in terms of nominal GDP, size of the GDP, China will never be able to match the per capita GDP of the United States. China will perhaps never be able to match the innovative capacities in science and technology, in defense technologies that the US is capable of. So trade and technology have been uh, areas of contestation. They have been weaponized like never before. The world also imagined that we should be able to uh, deal with territorial differences and resolve them through peaceful means. But we have seen that territorial disputes have a way of their own of disrupting peace and security. We have seen that explosion uh, in Europe, in Ukraine, and many people say that uh, you know these are black swan events. I mean, COVID-19 was also not a black swan, swan event. It was a gray rhino event. Everyone knew that the next pandemic is, is around the corner. Were you prepared? Did you make policies for it? Well, Ukraine was one such issue. Having read the tea leaves with regard to Russia's worldview, when it came to its relations with Georgia, its claims over Moldova or, uh, uh, you know, um, Abkhazia uh, or, or South Ossetia, um, its view on Crimea, uh, its view of Ukraine itself as, uh, as to whether it was a sovereign entity or not, the writing was on the wall. And territorial differences have actually fundamentally altered the nature of peace and security in the Indo-Pacific as well whether between China and Japan over the Senkakus in the East China Sea, whether between China and the Southeast Asian countries in the South China Sea, more fundamentally from our point of view, territorial differences have defined the nature of India-China relations today. The fourth T of uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, tenets uh, is also extraordinary uh, because uh, tenets are narratives, these are principles. These are values, and there is major power contestation today, particularly in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, to prove that one's systems of social, political, economic, and cultural governance uh, are superior to that of the rest. 
And for the first time in the existing global order, you see a challenge coming from authoritarian states. Authoritarian states that were like China claiming that they had a better grip on the COVID-19 pandemic, short-lived claims, because we have seen after the disastrous uh, you know, zero COVID policy that the Chinese economy has also greatly uh, floundered and um, you know, it faces a number of challenges today. Um, we have seen how terrorism is dividing the world today. Now, terrorism is something that 20 years ago was actually uniting the world. Uh, China was also cooperating with the United States against international terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11. But today you see the world is increasingly fractured uh, at the United Nations because countries like China are using their exceptionalism, their privileged power, veto power in the United uh, Nations Security Council to put a spanner in the works uh, by not allowing countries like the United States and India uh, to uh, successfully push through the global listing of terrorists of the uh, Lashkar e Toiba and the uh, you know Jashe Mohammed. So you see that terrorism, which should unite the world, is dividing the world. We are also seeing lack of transparency amidst all this. It's very easy to look at statistics and say that we know all about the Chinese economy. We know how the PLA has expanded its uh, air power. It is now acquiring a third aircraft carrier. We can do that kind of bean counting rather easily. But it's very difficult to read intentions and motivations. And that is where, because of an utter lack of transparency in the opaque system that China has, whether economic or military, it's very difficult to predict motivation, intention. We have the capabilities in place, and that a combination of capabilities and unpredictable motivations makes for a very uncertain situation, especially at a time when the Chinese are uh, spilling over into other geographies. They're spilling over politically, they're spilling over in terms of their military power, naval power, a transition from a brown water navy to a blue water navy, and how do we handle that great challenge of China is one of the puzzles of our times. It is a China that is not ready to throw out the baby with the bathwater. It is not a China that is fundamentally challenging the existence of the current global order, for it is this same order that has given rise to China. It is the same order which allowed China, the People's Republic, to helicopter into the Security Council as a veto-wielding member in 1971 when the Republic of China, that is Taiwan, was kicked out for geopolitical reasons uh, at a time of great reset between the United States and China in the hope that these two would work together to deal with an emerging threat from a rising Soviet Union at that time, which was pulling away in space, in, in atomic energy, in military power, etc. And so it is a China that is not about to say that we don't like the existing global order. But the Chinese do not uh, leave that uh, at, at that. The Chinese also say that the existing global order in part is imperfect. And they see this, they see this with a view to ensuring that the existing global order also increasingly accommodates their ambitions, their aspirations. They are also making an attempt to create parallel structures uh, in the likeness of China. Those structures like the, uh, you know, AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the New Development Bank of the BRICS, the expansion of the BRICS to bring in more members. This is an attempt, an ill-conceived attempt in reality, to build a constituency of their own, own in the likeness of their own aims and objectives. And so China is riding two horses at the same time. Ours is a very complex relationship with China, and in the course of my book, I have tried to explain by way of a primer, a chapter on the India-China relationship, which has undergone many challenges. Uh, in many ways, sometimes when I look back at the 42-year career that I've had dealing with, for example, the People's Republic. By the way, my ancestors dealt with China 200 years ago. I'm basically a Shah masquerading as a Chinoy. Uh, 200 years ago, one Seth Nanji Jekaran Shah of Mangrol uh, was uh, the first to set up the Gujarati community in Kolkata. And many years ago, the late uh, Sri S.S. Kanoria, who was also uh, president of FIKI in the old days, brought me uh, a lot of material from Kolkata uh, about this uh, sixth generation ancestor of mine, who not only founded the Gujarati community there, but also went on to live in China for 12 years. And Seth Nanji Jekaran Shah 
I must tell you this story. Um, for 12 years, he lived there, he prospered. By the way, he was in Shanghai. By the way, he spoke very good Chinese. Uh, my late mother used to think that I am Nanji Jekaran Shah reincarnate. <laughs> well, I do believe in, in reincarnation. Um, but the funny thing about Nanji Jekaran Shah was that he was such a disciplined man. Um, he did very well in China for 12 years. I'm, I'm talking about 1822 roughly to 1834. Uh, but when he comes back, uh, he comes back with three ships laden with goods. Uh, it had cannon on board in those days because you had to pass through the you know, piracy infested waters of Southeast Asia uh, through the Malacca and things like that. And when he reached the shores of India, he was so elated with emotion at uh, seeing the shores of his motherland again that he ordered all the cannon on board to fire a salvo in salute to the motherland. The British garrison thought that uh, they were about to be attacked uh, by some pirates. So they sent out gunboats, had this poor man surrounded, arrested, his goods were confiscated, he was put into uh, you know, the uh, uh, locker uh, room for a while, uh, he was uh, uh, interrogated. Uh, but to be fair to the British, they understood when uh, our old man explained that he was simply acting out of you know, emotion at being back home. He donated a large amount of his money uh, to building a Jain Derasar, which still stands in Palitana. Those of you who are Jains may want to go there. I haven't been able to make it, uh, but I must uh, travel to Palitana to see the uh, Nanji Chinai Chaumukhi Derasa, Nanji Shah Chaumukhi Derasa. It still stands there. Uh, and it was built with the uh, funds donated uh, nearly 200 years ago uh, of my ancestor. I have no lien over that uh, Derasa, don't worry. Um, and um, it is uh, because, you see, you all think that KYC is a modern concept, know your customer and all that. But the Jain Derasas invented the whole concept of KYC. You cannot donate to uh, uh, a Jain Derasar without their asking you a million questions about where you got that money from, what did you do, uh, how did you transfer it, etc. And so there were meticulous and copious records kept uh, in that Derasar. In the 1960s, there was a Jain Muni who was a scholar and he was doing a book on early traders of the west coast of India that traded with East Asia. And he fell upon my old man, my sixth generation ancestor, and his stories with great enthusiasm. There was so much material in those books. So I recall that uh, around 1965 or 1966, this scholar Muni came down to Rajkot uh, to our ancestral bungalow, which still stands there, uh, and told my father that uh, I have done a book on your ancestor, and here are 10 copies. And so I have those 10 copies. Uh, in fact, in my forthcoming book, somewhere I want to put in uh, a translation uh, of some of the chapters. But coming back to China, we always sought good relations with China. My book explores that theme. But can you have international relations where India has a positive policy towards China, but China has a negative policy towards India? Well, I'm afraid that's the situation in which we find ourselves. For all the protocols and agreements that we put in place, people like me worked for four decades to put in place confidence building measures, uh, you know, uh, building some kind of trust in the India-China border areas, uh, clarification and confirmation of the line of actual control and so on and so forth. These have actually been shattered on the harsh and cold rocks of Galwan in Ladakh in June 2020. We have a very complex relationship. Our current position is that we must restore normalcy in the India-China border areas for there to be trust, enough to be able to claim normalcy in the rest of the relationship. We can normalize the existence of differences that take time to resolve. We can normalize the existence of differences such that we have to continue negotiating for decades together. But we cannot normalize bloodshed. We cannot normalize bloodshed in the India-China border areas and then pretend ostrich-like that the rest of the relationship as the Chinese want us to do uh, you know, is to go back to normalcy in terms of people-to-people uh, -people ties and uh, political level dialogue. So it's a very complex relationship which we must look at closely. Um, friends, I think I've spoken at length. I do not want to uh, go beyond the uh, allocated time. Suffice it to say that if there are things uh, that you have, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, caught on to, if there are thoughts that have been bestirred by my remarks, 
then these, uh, I'm afraid, we can pick, pick up these themes further in the course of the conversation. I can see that Rajiv Bhai is actively waiting to ask me a few questions, uh, which may be very hard for me to answer. But let me tell you, frankly, it's quite comical to say this, but I thoroughly enjoyed reading my own book. <laughs> and I learned a great deal. <laughs> the funny thing is that a week or two ago, I was told that I have to speak about my book, and I was petrified. I said, look, I wrote that, but I've forgotten all about it. <laughs> so it was like going back to my college days, to my UPSC days. I said, where's that book? And I snatched a copy, uh, you know, uh, from my uh, shelf at home, and I poured over it in the course of one evening and the next morning. But the funny thing was that it was a very racy read. And 270 pages, I devoured them, uh, almost objectively like a third person reading somebody else's book. And I did that uh, by the morning. And my event, uh, lo and behold, was quite successful. And as I said, I learned a great deal by reading my own book. But uh, uh, honestly, I, I, I put it down because I thought it would benefit uh, the younger generation at the school level or the university level, UPSC aspirants, but why just them? Also people who are in business. See, today, what's happening in the country and what's happening externally, these cannot be delinked. You're operating in an environment in which these are uh, to be contextualized. These are linked. Uh, external policies impact on your you know, domestic situation and vice versa. And it is also very important uh, to understand that the world of business today is increasingly subject to uh, geopolitical uh, developments. The impact of uh, geostrategic developments and geopolitical differences has a way of adversely impacting uh, the business world as well. We have seen that. Virtually every known vector of globalization, you would note, has been disrupted recently. Uh, the Ukraine war, uh, we speak about the disruption to food, fertilizer, and, uh, you know, fuel. There's also the fourth F of, of uh, finance. Uh, total disruption there. Uh, we have seen how globalization, if we talk about key vectors such as trade, technology, finance, and movement of human resources, these were also disrupted, not the least by the COVID-19 pandemic. So what happens out there is of concern. It's better to understand it fundamentally before you take uh, geoeconomic decisions of the type that any large corporation today must take. Uh, why did I say geo-economic decisions? Because sitting out here in business today, you cannot say, I will operate in my cocoon. Nary a thought for supply chains. I have no clue about uh, w w what you mean by, you know, manufacturing hubs of uh, imports and exports and tariffs and weaponization of, of tariffs, uh, non-tariff barriers, technical barriers to trade, phytosanitary standards. I mean, you can, as the Chinese have done, you can jinx the export of Indian agricultural products to China, despite our having the potential to export, by resorting to such things. So business people have to understand why we excel at IT in the United States of America, uh, why we are able to export uh, a very large quantum of our IT goods and services to the, to the United States, but we can't repeat that performance in China. For that part of geoeconomics is subject to geopolitics. Uh, so it's very simple. Uh, so I leave you with that thought uh, uh, in the hope that uh, we can interact uh, in the future as well. And, and I hope I have not overstayed my uh, kind of presence at the podium. But thank you very much. And thanks once again, all of you for coming here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sujan Bhai, for enriching us with your theme address and how you lucidly explain how the world order has changed over the 100 years. And shall I also say how your family transformed from Shahs to Chinois now, you know. So I'll invite our office bearers, um, Rajiv Bhai, Savan Bhai, and all the past presidents of AMA, and of course, Mr. Amit Shukla, to come up for the book launch. We'll do the book launch, and then the conversation with uh, Raju Bhai will have with Sujan. Please, please come on.
Yes. I'll now request our Secretary Rajiv Bhai in our today's event sponsor to start the conversation with Ambassador Sujan Chinoy and thereafter conduct the question and answer. Thank you. <laughs> so it was a good evening, everybody, and it was indeed a great. Uh, historical chronological uh, order of events that we could hear today right from uh, World War I up to nearly the current times and uh, I'm sure it has given a lot of additional information to each one of us sitting over here. So thank you very much for this great uh, uh, chronology of events. So, <laughs> I had a few questions which were related to the timeline, but most of it you gave it so elaborately that some of the questions have definitely become redundant. Uh, what I would like to ask you, Sujan Bhai, is you know, more on what next? Um, and in fact, I personally feel that you would have to write a series of books like this time in, in recent time, you know, in the future time, so that we all get updated and we call you and then you give us a complete, uh, uh, you know, download on historical events. I, I will soon inflict uh, a sequel <laughs> yes. on all of you. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, uh, my first question is related to the G20, India's presidency. Uh, in the G20 and what is your assessment on this whole G20 and India's role, um, you know, with it taking it so aggressively? Never ever has the G20 summits been so much known and so much in public uh, knowledge and information ever. So, uh, your assessment on it, sir. Thank you very much, Rajiv, for that uh, very important question. Uh, I mean, you, uh, you know, are aware that the G20 brings together 19 of the world's largest economies, one great area known as the European Union. Uh, and the G20 today is the largest single group that is capable of building consensus at the global level. At a time when the UN Security Council has abdicated its responsibilities with regard to the major challenges that face us, be it uh, economic recovery, be it addressing the financial distress felt by a very large part of the global south, be it uh, other issues to do with uh, gender equality, the achievement of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. We are at the halfway mark already, and by 2030, we are supposed to achieve uh, in fulsome measure these SDGs. And we find that the existing global structures are incapable, increasingly, subjected to major power contestation. They are incapable of delivery. And the G20 is really one big hope before the global community. To start with, it was never meant to address 
political issues. It was not meant to address geopolitical issues, but only economic issues. And it has done well in the past with regard to that. We have seen in the aftermath of the global financial and economic crises, especially when uh, around 2008, when it was elevated to the level of uh, uh, you know, heads of state and government, that the G20 has delivered on a number of issues. So as it's a rotating presidency, it is now India's turn. This year, we are about to finish. Um, we have done three-fourths of uh, our time. By the end of this year, we will hand over to Brazil. It's a genuine chance for India to show the right way forward, to refocus the global community's attention. And uh, by the way, India has done it in a splendid way. You're right in saying that never before has the G20 been taken to such heights. Never before has the G20 fired the imagination of more than 1.4 billion people. 1.4 billion people in India have been made aware of the external world through the G20. The world has been prepared for a rising India through the G20. So it is a, a phenomenal success, regardless of what comes out in the document at the end of uh, the uh, you know, uh, summit itself. What have we done? We have placed focus once again, front and center on gender equality, on reforms of uh, the United Nations and other Bretton Woods and other organizations, the multilateral development banks or the international financial institutions. We have brought focus back on things that we do best, which is what we call transparent and accessible digital public infrastructure. We've been able to share with the rest of the world through the course of the last one year, our best practices with regard to, for instance, the India stack uh, and uh, the Jandan, Aadhaar, uh, and mobile uh, you know, platforms, the JAM, Trinity, the UPI. Uh, we do it at uh, the cheapest cost in, and the most efficient manner uh, that can be done anywhere in the world. And so we have brought into focus, for instance, the one big challenge of our times, which is climate change. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi himself has uh, you know, uh, proposed lifestyle uh, for environment, now known as lifestyle for sustainable development, which is aimed at creating pro-planet people, which is aimed at telling us, as we are told on even flights now, that uh, the Prime Minister has proposed lifestyle for environment. What is that message? That message is that this great challenge of our times, climate change, and we will be irresponsible if we do not do something about it. If we leave future generations to grapple with something that will be devastating in consequence, we have been told to become more responsible in terms of our daily lives. So for me, uh, whether it is climate change, climate finance, to ensure a just and equitable green transition, uh, whether it is gender equality, whether it is digital public infrastructure, whether it is uh, you know, reform multilateralism, whether it's economic recovery, macroeconomic recovery, etc. Uh, this is something that India has been able to do very well, and we have emerged as a voice for the global community. India is not doing the G20 only for itself. It is speaking on behalf of the developing countries. If there's one voice today that is a credible voice for the global south, it is India, and we have a track record there. Whatever we have proposed in recent years, it has uh, uh, something that's pro bono whether it's the International Solar Alliance, whether it is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, whether it is infrastructure for resilient island states, whether it is the One Sun, One World, One Grid concept, whether it is the International Day of Yoga. Um, and, and all of that uh, is something that we have been proposing, as you know, for global good. So uh, I think regardless of the summit and its outcomes, for me, the G20 has proved to be a huge success. Uh, uh, taking this on the same lines, now we have so many other uh, groups with a few countries in it, uh, with India taking a lead in BRICS, in, you know, in this G20, etc., all these things. Where is the United Nations going? in? What about the current situation where India has been talking for a permanent seat in the Security Council, and it's just not happening because of the veto powers that some hold? 
then we have NATO, which is trying to expand its membership to areas which are far south of the Atlantic Ocean or west of the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, the Ukraine conflict, one of the things what we read is that uh, the, the NATO membership has also pushed the whole Ukraine conflict. So my question is, where is United Nations in all these things? And in with India playing such a re lead role and it not getting a permanent seat, do you think the United Nations will remain to be a strong voice. So that's uh, a moot question. The future of the existing global order as defined by the post-World War II structures anchored in the uh, United Nations. Will it continue? Will it deliver? That's the moot question. One fundamental premise for me is that global orders do not change easily. Global orders cannot be changed or dismantled very easily. They change as a result of catastrophic events, wars especially. That is what history has taught us. Global orders do not change out of the milk of human kindness because fine words are said in the you know, saloons of uh, the United Nations or in individual capitals demanding transparency and inclusivity, etc. Global orders, therefore, are very difficult to change. Now, here we have the classic example, a classic example of entrenched vested interests on the part of permanent members of the Security Council who would not want to share power, who would not want to, who are loath to see yet another member come in and demand equality, demand uh, an exceptional privileged veto power of the type that they have been used to wielding. You have seen that many of the permanent members are in fact depleted powers. I mean, we've already overtaken Great Britain in terms of the size of our economy. But truth to tell, uh, Russia is, uh, of course, 6,300 nuclear weapons uh, with uh, uh, thousands of uh, you know, ballistic missiles. But its economy is less than half that of India. And yet it sits there. Uh, and when the Chinese entered, uh, you know, the UN Security Council, whether the Republic of China in 1945 or the People's Republic in 1971, they did not have uh, the kind of uh, economy, uh, you know, that India has today. And yet India sits out with 1.4 billion people with uh, complete, uh, you know, 100% commitment to the uh, principles of the UN Charter, having contributed immensely uh, to the welfare of the international community through, and we continue to do that through our vaccine, Maitri, and other assistance that we provide. Uh, our emphasis on bringing the African Union into the G20 once again demonstrates our you know, outlook for the rest of the world. Uh, time and again, Prime Minister has been speaking of our vision of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, of uh, you know, uh, one world, one family, one future. And there is no other country that is out there giving a new moral compass to the rest of the world as India is doing today. So I think the game has already moved away from the United Nations. Since the UN is not func functioning, it's dysfunctional to say the very least. There is an increasing tendency to go in for bilateralism or uh, plurilateralism or regionalism, working with like-minded partners. And many of these groups that you see uh, are a reflection of that. Now, the one unique feature of the world today is that there is a lot of hedging. There is a lot of multi-alignment. So when you look at these groups that you referred to, like the SCO and the BRICS, uh, these are uh, uh, you know, in themselves uh, enigmatic at times. Uh, for example, in the BRICS today, uh, you have uh, uh, seen an expansion uh, at the latest uh, summit, uh, bringing in six additional countries. Um, and there were five already, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. South Africa having been added, uh, you know, a, a, almost a decade after BRICS came into existence. It came in only in 2010. Now you have an expansion with six more. Um, but of course, uh, this list is like what you call a common denominator. I mean, seriously, uh, would Ethiopia seriously contribute to uh, global geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, you know, themes. Um, so many of these structures today are overlapping. You find that uh, 
countries that depend on the United States of America for their uh, security well-being, uh, and by that I mean countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Turkey is a member of NATO, you'll find many of them voting with China when it comes to uh, human rights resolutions in Geneva. So it's a very complex world. From my point of view, uh, India is developing its own credibility. It has risen. It is destined to rise. We have entered the Amritkal period. Uh, whether uh, others like it or not, India is going to grow. It is going to be a country uh, that will take its rightful place uh, at the uh, head table uh, in the International Committee of Nations uh, within the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, and so we need not worry too much about groups. Our credibility goes beyond these groups. Uh, these groups are often themselves subject to geopolitical, uh, you know, most common denominator kind of uh, outcomes. In the SEO, for example, uh, we are there, Pakistan is there, uh, and China is there, the Central Asians are there, Russia is there, and there's only so much you can do when between large countries like India and China you have so many differences. And I would imagine that same malaise would affect uh, the BRICS also to some extent. Um, and uh, as in the case of the UN Security Council, so also outside of it, this kind of friction will uh, you know, play its role. India will have to find its own pathway. And our credible pathway lies in continuing to do what we do best, which is we are trying to do the best by our people, but we are also trying to do our best for the rest of the world. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive uh, reply. I think all your replies are so comprehensive that further questions in like itself get reduced. <laughs> uh, now, talking on, again, this is in continuation. Um, we spoke about G20 and the United Nations. All this, it seems, is boiling down to the current diplomacy, which has been uh, spearheaded by our prime minister, and the way he has taken things forward. What is the difference between the current way of diplomacy in the current regime as against different from the earlier governments, the earlier prime ministers? Well, that's a fair question to ask me because uh, I can say with conviction that I've seen it over exactly 42 years uh, on the trot um, uh, without having, you know, uh, sort of uh, been out of the broader uh, ecosystem or the team for a day. So what I say, uh, I say with conviction. Oh, never before have I seen uh, in my life, uh, in my professional career, a prime minister who spent so much time trying to actually understand international affairs, uh, give uh, time to uh, you know policymakers to to do deep thinking, to formulate uh, ideas, suggestions often directly to him, uh, and then to pick on the best of those ideas, run them through the collegiate of uh, government systems to bring about the best results. And uh, one very big difference is the ability to address complex issues uh, when leaders meet. I have seen that uh, uh, we are not beating about the bush uh, when it comes to complex issues. I mean, I'm tempted to draw a parallel. I hope you will not see it as, uh, uh, you know, pejorative remarks or churlish on my part to make this observation. But it's a fact of history that in the 1950s, soon after India and China came into a kind of modern contemporary existence, we were midwifed around the same time into existence in 1947 and 49, respectively. And overnight, our frontiers, those loose, uh, you know, broad swathes of territory that defined our periphery overnight became boundaries because as nation states we were looking for identity and you can't have an identity without clear-cut borders and so uh, it pitted India and China against each other uh, in, uh, you know, the border areas and uh, very early on in the 50s this friction uh, was very apparent and when the Panchil agreement was being negotiated between India and China in 1954, the instructions given by the political leadership at that time to the Indian negotiating team uh, were that, uh, please do not discuss the boundary question. If the Chinese were to raise this uh, vexatious and thorny issue of the 
boundary question, please disengage and come back. Now, I think that is not what we do today because one cannot afford to sweep complex issues under the carpet. We have to tell it like it is. If there are differences, we have to sit across the table and discuss. And I find that the, this leadership is doing that, and not in an undiplomatic way, with uh, full expression of desire for peace and cooperation in the finest possible gentlemanly manner, we are able to put across key issues. Uh, this is not an India to be toyed with. It's a new India. India is confident it's on the rise. It's also going to make it. Uh, it's it's uh, like the proverbial uh, tortoise and the, the hare kind of story. We will also get there. Um, and we might find somebody sleeping along the way. So uh, the other thing I've noticed is this uh, incredible uh, ability to reach out to the rest of the world. There are countries that have been visited in the last nine years by the prime minister and his team, core team, including the foreign minister, uh, successive foreign ministers, whether Sushma ji or Jai Shankar ji, around the world, countries that had not been visited for 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, Greece was not visited for four decades. Uh, Australia had not been visited for, uh, you know, like three decades. Uh, in our neighborhood countries like Nepal and Sri Lanka had not been visited for a decade and a half, two decades. Now, what kind of foreign policy was that? If you do not engage your immediate neighbors at the level of the prime minister, and if you do not set your neighborhood uh, in order through this kind of active diplomacy, you cannot have results. Our neighborhood first policy is very active today. The kind of work that we are doing in the Maldives, where we have been able to kind of flip over uh, what was earlier an adverse uh, situation under Yamin, we have done exceptionally well. When you look at how the prime minister, uh, you know, and these are facts, they have to be noted for what they are, that when he goes on overseas trips, uh, he uses even night halts at the airport uh, to do work. It is not unusual to have the prime minister meet people at the airport at 2 a.m. in the morning while the aircraft is being refueled. In the earlier days when I was OSD press relations uh, in the 1990s, we would go off to a five-star hotel and sleep it off and come back the next morning. Uh, but none of that currently. The ability to engage the diaspora, 32 million people. I have never seen the diaspora in all my long years in the Foreign Service ever being engaged in the same manner. The, the way in which uh, our embassies have been made accountable and uh, responsive to the needs of Indians overseas. Today, Indians are doing extremely well overseas. They're being tapped into uh, in terms of their contributions to strengthen our foreign policy interests in those countries, but also to get them to invest in a rising India, to be part of the process here. Beyond that, the use of Indian lexicon, the use of Indian idiom, the use of foundational Indian strategic thought to formulate our policies, to express our foreign policy and strategies. I mean, there's no point in talking about, uh, you know, uh, European strategic thinkers uh, when we have our own history of strategic thought in India, indigenous strategic thought. So all this and more, uh, personal relations with leaders, uh, how on earth do you think we get to cooperate with a country like Saudi Arabia and others like the UAE with regard to intelligence sharing? I served as the deputy chief of mission in Saudi Arabia in 1995 and 96. Uh, I could never have imagined having uh, intelligence cooperation or naval cooperation with Saudi Arabia or with the UAE. What is it that has enabled us to even get to large countries within the OIC? a community that's not otherwise very well uh, disposed towards uh, issues like Kashmir and all, to actually cooperate with us. Again, a long answer to a short No, question. but very comprehensive, so thank you for that. I mean, the fact that you... Uh, you asked for it. Every <laughs> uh, so with this, again, this leads on to the next question with the background that India is doing so well in terms of diplomacy, uh, in terms of uh, you know expressing itself and taking the world along with it. But there is always a question mark in everybody's mind. There's some article in the paper, something in the news, India and China. Where are we headed towards in this relationship? 
So personally, I believe that uh, it's a fact of history that India and China have to coexist. And the preferred way to coexist would be through peace and cooperation. But I would say emphatically as equals. As equals and on the principles of mutual respect. And so therefore, it is very important for China to introspect its policies towards India. When it demands that India have a good policy, a friendly policy and positive policy towards China, it is uh, dichotomous, uh, to say the least, if China does not have an equally positive and equally friendly relationship towards India. And we don't see evidence of that. So it cannot be a one-sided relationship. Secondly, there are issues like the long-standing vestigial uh, legacy inherited problem of the India-China boundary question. Uh, I mean, people like me have grappled with it for decades, tried to negotiate confidence building measures, tried to put in place best practices so that our troops uh, you know, are able to disengage uh, you know, without any kind of uh, conflict. But uh, uh, it's not good enough to sign agreements if one of the two sides is not committed to its implementation. And so it's vital that China commits itself to the fullest implementation of consensus that was reached between the top leadership, whether at Wuhan, whether at Mamallapuram, uh, where we had the informal summits, or on the basis of the slew of agreements and protocols that we have put in place very diligently over past decades, beginning with the Border Peace and Tranquility Agreement in 1993, the Confidence Building Measures Agreement in 1996, the Guiding Principles uh, and political parameters for resolution of the boundary question in 2005, attendant protocols. There are so many protocols that we have put in place about behavior in the India-China border areas, how troops must disengage, how they must behave when they run into each other in areas with uh, you know, overlapping or contested claims. There is this huge issue of the line of actual control that we must come to grips with. What is the line of actual control? India never had a line of actual control. In the past, we had only an international boundary. The Chinese created facts on the ground by claiming, as Cho Wen Lai did through his letter of 7 November 1959 addressed to Nehru, that there is something called the line of actual control in uh, uh, you know, uh, the Western sector, uh, in which China claimed that they were already there in Aksai Chin somewhere. They were never there where they claimed they were. They came up creepingly, a salami slicing tactics, uh, further compounded by the 1962 war, uh, a slow creeping presence. But by the mid 70s, we also said, we might have to negotiate with the Chinese. The world had changed. Bangladesh had been born. The Sino-US relationship had been reset. And India and China were also, were also looking at a new kind of engagement after a hiatus of 14 years after the 1962 war. We hadn't spoken to each other for nearly 14 to 15 years. And when we did that, of course, one of the key requirements of good relations is to have a clear-cut boundary. I mean, it's good fences that make good neighbors, isn't it? And if you don't have good fences, how do you have a good neighborly relationship? So China must come forth with regard to clarification of the line of actual control on large-scale maps. The only sector where we've been able to achieve this was way back uh, two decades ago when we exchanged maps for the middle sector. The middle sector is the smallest of the problems. It is uh, 2,000 square kilometers of contested territory. But how about the much larger pockets in Ladakh today where we are grappling with friction points where disengagement has not yet taken place, like the Deep Sang Plains, for instance, where there are issues with regard to patrolling access, etc., or in Demchok, in the southern end of uh, Ladakh, where again, there are contested claims. In the eastern sector, China claims the whole of Arunachal Pradesh. In the western sector, we claim the whole of Aksai Chin. So we have to learn uh, to be equals. And China cannot uh, keep its markets closed deliberately against Indian products. It cannot demand that India open up everything, whereas China will have the freedom to decide what comes in from India. This kind of unilateralism, even in economic relations is responsible, quite apart from what you might say are structural differences. If I speak to a Chinese economist, he'll say, look, don't blame us. This is because 
of structural differences in the economy that you have an adverse balance of trade in excess of $100 billion. But I don't quite see it that way. I think there is a great deal of what you call unfair policy towards India, which results in such things. So we must coexist, but as equals. It's uh, uh, you know, a world in which there is probably enough place for both to coexist, as successive leaders have said. Whether it was Tang Xiaoping who told Rajiv Gandhi in 1988, and I was desk officer for China even then, I was part of that visit. Uh, whether it is Dr. Manmohan Singh, whether it is uh, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, all have spoken about there being enough space in Asia for two great civilizations to coexist, but as equals. Thank you for, again, the elaborate uh, answer. One well, last question is uh, on the Indian currency, the Indian rupee becoming as one of the main currencies for trading. In fact, uh, uh, there are a few countries with whom now we already do uh, rupee business. So I think uh, if, uh, if, if you could just give your view on that. Uh, this time around, I'll genuinely try to give a short answer. <laughs> because uh, the movers and shakers of the Indian rupee are here in the room. And I dare not say much. But you see, my point is that, uh, uh, you know, a currency uh, becomes a dominant currency or an internationally accepted currency on the basis of your economic power. Uh, and by economic power, I also mean your export power. Uh, what kind of... Uh, balance of trade you have. Uh, and I think we have to work harder in that regard. I'm sure we're going to touch $1 trillion in terms of exports in the near future. But will that be enough? We have to look at uh, how is our trade structured today? What is the domestic savings rate? Uh, how much are we actually doing with regard to exports uh, to the uh, you know, dynamic parts of the world? Uh, I believe that the preponderant part of our exports today is still to traditional economies in the West, which are already showing signs of deflation. Germany is officially going into some kind of uh, recession. Um, so uh, we have to look at our tariff rates. If our tariff rates are very high, uh, then our supply chains are going to be more expensive and distorted. It will also have an impact on our exports. So I think from my, uh, you know, sort of uh, layman's point of view, um, I should say that India has to work very hard and proactively, as it's been doing, to up its game with regard to exports. This is going to be tall order in a world where there isn't much appetite right now. The economies are flagging everywhere. Uh, markets are not simply available. There's a lot of competition. If a country like China is finding the, the, the headwinds there, uh, no doubt India will also face these headwinds. Secondly, get the neighborhood right. If the neighborhood accepts India's rise, if there is greater uh, intra-South Asian trade, which currently is woeful at about 4.5% compared to intra-regional trade that we've seen uh, in Latin America or Southeast Asia, uh, we will be able to prop up the rupee also. Well, countries like Sri Lanka are already showing interest because of the recent uh, dependence on India uh, in terms of bailing them out, the $4 billion that we've given and the commitments that we have, we have made. So let the economy speak for itself. Um, and uh, till then, let us also not uh, run away from what is obviously the dominant currency uh, like the US dollar. Uh, virtually everything, particularly commodities, whether it is uh, energy, whether it is rare earths, whether it is other resources, they're all denominated in US dollars. Uh, the, the road to any uh, export destination runs through uh, banks in the United States of America. And uh, no harm there, because uh, the dollar is still, a, the greenback is still a good bet. Thank you again for your answer. <laughs>